welcome to another edition of Service News. In this month's programme, tackling speedometer noise on Montego. An update of the accredited technician programme. Will radio interference become a thing of the past? A report on the necessity of spray booths for approved paint repairers. And the MG Metro Challenge, a sporting chance for everyone. Well, to start the programme, though, we've news of a change. As you will have recently heard, the British Leyland Board has changed the company's name from BL PLC to the Rover Group PLC. This change affects only the holding company. Austin Rover will continue to operate as Austin Rover Group Limited. The Rover Group PLC heralds a new image to coincide with Austin Rover's launch of the Rover 800 series and a new era of motoring excellence. And now, as promised at the last edition, more news of the accredited technician program. The program coordinators at Cowley are now putting the finishing touches to the database which will store and analyse technician training information throughout the network. Now, as part of this process, the first 250 registrations received have been extensively used to test the programme. From this initial batch of 3,000 forms, there are many technicians who have already completed enough training to qualify for accredited status. The very first qualifiers from each region are, in Scottish region, Christopher Bage, foreman and partner of Village Lane Garage, Washington, Tyne and Weir. In Northern Region, Philip Rowland, Keith Jennings and Danny Gamble, all of F. Horner & Son Limited, Manchester. In Midland Region, Rodney Warhurst of C&C Motors, Ruskington, Lincolnshire. In Southern Region, Dennis Jordan and John Jarvis of Crouch Hill Motor Company, London North 4. And in Western Region, Ronald Bardy of Deer Brothers, Westmore's Dorset. So our congratulations to them. But for the rest of you, there's not much longer to wait. A new computer program created specifically for the ATP is nearly ready. The first printout dealing with training history and qualifications gained up to March this year should be with you by the end of August, complete with a newsletter explaining how the accredited technician program will run. Training for the Rover 800 series will also qualify for the ATP and will be added to the database as soon as possible. Now, if you haven't returned your registration forms, it's not too late, but do it soon or you won't be included in the program. We all know how annoying radio interference is, especially when we're trying to listen to a program on a long journey or stuck in a traffic jam. Usually, it's not the radio receiver at fault. Interference is often caused by incorrect earthing of the aerial. The rectification procedure is set out in Technical Bulletin Item 649, so refer to this for precise figures and specifications before carrying out any tests. To check the earth, an electrical circuit must be set up between the battery and the aerial. Remove the lead from the battery positive terminal and the aerial lead from its socket at the rear of the receiver. And on Metro and Mini, also disconnect the supplementary aerial earth, as this earth isn't the one we're immediately concerned with. Connect a 12 ohm resistor between the positive terminal and the outer sleeve of the aerial lead. Set a multimeter to measure in excess of 12 volts. Connect its negative lead to the battery negative terminal and the positive lead to the outer sleeve of the aerial lead. The electrical current will follow the path of least resistance. So if the earth is good, the current will travel to earth through the resistor and the aerial outer braid, and only a small voltage will show on the meter. If the earth is bad, the circuit will be incomplete and the meter will register the battery voltage. If this occurs, remove the aerial Check the earth contact and braid, refit the aerial and retest. If a low voltage reading is obtained, signifying a good earth, reset the multimeter to millivolts, making sure the voltage isn't high enough to overload the meter. If the reading is less than 100, the earth is satisfactory. If more, remove the aerial, check and clean the earth contact and retest. 
So, a simple way of overcoming an annoying problem, which in many cases will render radio interference a thing of the past. Now, on to a point about handbrake adjustment on Maestro and Montego models. Technical bulletin item 532 pointed out the danger of over-adjusting handbrake cables and thus holding brake shoes partly applied and clear of their stops. More often than not, no adjustment is necessary, so we'll go through the checking procedure for you. Release the handbrake lever fully. Press the brake pedal firmly several times. Then, from underneath the car, pull the handbrake inner cable downwards and release it sharply. This centralises the linkage. Now, check free play at the brake shoe stops, which protrude from each backplate. You should be able to rotate the stops between your finger and thumb, but end float should not be more than two millimetres. If adjustment is required, rotate the cable adjuster clockwise to increase end float and anti-clockwise to decrease it. After adjustment, pull the inner cable downwards and release it sharply as before. Then recheck end float on the stops. One vital point. Ignore the number of ratchet clicks on the handbrake as you pull it up. This doesn't apply as an indicator of the state of adjustment for modern self-adjusting rear brakes. Bear this in mind during PDI and make sure the information is passed on to your customers. From August onwards, the concept of Supershore motoring is being strongly promoted to customers through a two-page display in the latest issue of the Range catalogue. Supershore, Austin Rover's optional warranty, offers customers a further 12 or 24 months mechanical breakdown insurance after the expiry of the first year warranty. The benefits of AA membership are continued and car hire contributions are added. All in all, a very attractive package for Austin Rover owners. But for you in the service network, Supershore is far more than a sales initiative. It's a valuable customer retention package tying your customers to your service department for the duration of the policy. Ideally, Supershore should be offered by your sales staff to all customers at point of sale. But the policy can be taken up at any time during the first 120 days of ownership. And this is where you come in. What better way to cement your relationship with the customer than by introducing him to Supershore on his first visit to your dealership for his 1,000 mile service? Don't miss that vital opportunity. At a recent conference between the Lookers Group and some of Austin Rover's top service personnel, one of the main subjects highlighted was the problem of speedo tick on Montego and Maestro models. Alterations have now been incorporated in production, but on earlier cars the problem is usually that the speedo cable is bent at a sharp angle. Now to overcome this problem, a modified cable must be rerouted through the bulkhead so it runs straight into the speedometer. The new cables and speedos should be fitted as a pair. Part numbers are set out in technical bulletin items 618 and 671. The rerouting procedure is detailed in item 516. Before you start, disconnect the battery. Then remove the plenum closing panel and rubber seal. To demonstrate the procedure more clearly, we've also removed the plenum air intake panel. Disconnect the instrument pack and the speedo cable. The existing cable hole will no longer be used, so fit a blanking grommet to make it watertight. If necessary, cut a 28mm hole in the bulkhead and cut away the interior sound ending material around the hole. Then, cut a notch in the plenum lip, exactly in line with the new cable hole. The exact dimensions and positions of these holes are set out in bulletin item 516 and should be followed carefully. Refit the instrument pack with new speedo using the grommet to centre the speedo cable. Note that this is a two-man operation. The cable must be pulled from the engine compartment as the pack is pushed back into position. Failure to do this will result in kinking of the cable. To ensure that the cable doesn't rest on the demister duct, amplifying any sound, pad either the duct or the cable itself. Refit the rubber seal of the plenum closing panel and before fitting the plastic panel, cut a notch in it to match that on the bulkhead. 
on Montego ensure that the heater air intake water shedder is held by the bonnet rear seal so it doesn't foul the wiper linkage. Then reconnect the speedo drive to the gearbox, making sure it's positioned exactly as before in the engine compartment. On some EFI models, the speed transducer box may need to be relocated on the clutch housing to provide a passage for the rerouted speedo cable. So, a fairly straightforward but potentially fiddly operation, but at least your customer will be able to enjoy motoring without that annoying tick. Now, as promised, that report on paint spray booths. Austin Rover has laid down a set of minimum facilities a dealership needs in order to qualify as an approved repairer. Now, the reasoning behind that decision is based on the paint manufacturer's own recommendations. We spoke to Dr. Andrew Morby, Director of Marketing at PPG Industries Limited, a major manufacturer of automotive paints, and asked him why his company recommends a spray booth for applying and drying their products. First of all, for health and safety reasons, uh, paints containing isocyanates, as all warranty approved paint materials do, must be applied for safety reasons in an enclosed environment by somebody who is protected by an airfed mask. Uh, secondly, for quality reasons, uh, only in a, uh, a filtered, warm environment can you get a, a good, glossy, dust-free paint film. And thirdly, for reasons of economics, that uh, if you're not going to get involved in lengthy rectification work because of dust inclusion, then you must get the optimum uh, facilities for applying the paint. Dr. Morby mentions a warm environment as one essential element for applying and drying paint. Does PPG advocate an optimum temperature? Uh, we generally recommend around 60 degrees centigrade for low stoving, which is really the optimum temperature between speed of drying and uh, the danger if you get much over 60 degrees centigrade of damage to the vehicle. So, 60 degrees for drying paint, and PPG also recommends between 15 and 30 degrees for application. But what happens on those cold winter days when the workshop isn't as warm as it should be? We asked Dr. Morby how applying paint at low temperatures affects the finish. Well, paints are balanced in terms of the solvent content to be applied at particular temperatures. And if they're applied at much lower temperatures, then the, the main result is that the solvents are slower to evaporate off and the paint film stays wet for longer. That can, of course, result in runs and sags uh, in terms of metallic paints, you, you lose metallic control and you, there's danger of shear and clouds in the in paint film. Uh, because it stays wetter and tacky longer, then there's more danger of dirt inclusion. And also there's a danger of moisture condensing onto the surface and that can cause loss of gloss. At worst, it can cause blistering and loss of adhesion. So, how does a spray booth comply with these manufacturers' recommendations? We spoke to a representative of Spraybake Limited, a major manufacturer of spray booths, and asked what a spray booth consisted of. Uh, it's a ventilated enclosure with strictly controlled heating to achieve temperatures of 20 degrees centigrade for spraying and 60 degrees centigrade for curing uh, two-pack paints. Um, the features over open workshop uh, spraying are that uh, the booth has turbulent free and filtered airflow and uh, a high level of uh, shadow-free illumination. It sounds ideal, but is it really worth it? Wouldn't it be cheaper to simply flat and polish dirt out of the surface? Dr. Morby disagrees. Uh, the uh, finish eventually will be no worse for that, but the main problem is that it's a very time-consuming uh, and therefore expensive job. Uh, if you get a very large level of dirt inclusion into the paint film, then it may be necessary to spot repair or even at worst respray the whole area which again is a, a big expense in terms of labor and material perhaps the prospect of disruption to your workshop is putting you off buying that spray booth but installation takes a surprisingly short time well once the site has been prepared um, the booth takes about three to four days to be installed that is of course um, regarding interior sites. Exterior units will take a little bit longer because we're basically at the, uh, the mercy of the weather. And once you've invested in a spray booth, there's no danger of it becoming obsolete. Your spray booth will continue to save you time and money well into the future. 
there's no doubt that whatever paint technology comes up in the foreseeable future, it, it will still be absolutely essential to apply it in a clean, dry, warm environment in order to get the best results. That will certainly not change. So, an area which has attracted much comment. The experts come out heavily in favour of a spray booth for safety, quality, economics. The approved repairers who have complied with the minimum standards would agree. Isn't it time you join them? A Metro or Montego Turbo is exhilarating to drive, that is, if the engine's tuned correctly. If not, owners can be disappointed with performance. Because of this, a Service Insight video will shortly be available featuring a step-by-step -step guide on how to keep your customers' turbos the raciest cars on the road. Now, moving on to a subject which is extremely important to everyone, customer satisfaction. In order to reward high performance in this vital aspect of our business, a pilot program was introduced earlier this year which measured dealer performance in the areas of customer correspondence received by Austin Rover's Customer Relations Department, independent customer satisfaction surveys, warranty performance, and achievement of service minimum standards, and mystery shopper exercises conducted by regional office staff. We would like to congratulate the following dealers who consistently achieved a high performance in the categories chosen for assessment. McCarg, Rennie and Lindsay, Glasgow, Hartwells of Abingdon, Sykes of Woomwell, PJ Green of Floor, Swain and Jones Farnham, H. Ball of Bridgewater, Chessant Motor Company, Lookers of Bradford, Dunblane Motor Company, and Marshalls of Cambridge. Now, in recognition of their commitment to customer satisfaction, Representatives from each dealership were invited as VIP guests to the Rover 800 launch in Montreux. At a private cocktail party there, they each received a Customer Satisfaction Award from Roy Davies, Director UK Customer Service. As a result of the support given by dealers, we'll be developing this programme into an exclusive service guild, which will incorporate three categories of dealers to cover large, medium and small outlets, so everyone will be judged on equal terms. Dealers will be assessed on a regular basis, providing an opportunity to improve their standards throughout the year. The Service Guild assessments will operate on a quarterly basis, but the criteria will vary from quarter to quarter. For example, the next assessments will be based on warranty performance, product training standards, ATP registrations, Supershore sales and customer care. These and all other parameters are discussed and agreed by your service operations panel. Now, if a Montego is regularly driven on unsealed roads, loose stones or gravel may be chipping paintwork around the rear wheel arch area. In some cases, this could lead to severe damage and corrosion. To overcome this problem, stone-resistant guard tapes should be fitted. Now, if you're finding it difficult to fit the tapes smoothly, they may need alteration. A technical bulletin explaining this procedure has just been issued, but we'll go over the main points for you. In cases of severe corrosion to the wheel arch, the area must be refinished using the approved methods and materials. To fit the guards, first clean the wheel arches using wax and grease remover. The guard tapes available initially should be cut to the required shape using the template attached to the bulletin. Align the tape in this position Then remove the backing paper. Pressing the tape firmly down to expel any air bubbles. Then remove the front protective covering and check that all edges are stuck down correctly. Remember, it's essential that you cut the guard tape to the correct shape. Otherwise, you'll have great difficulty in getting it to stick to the surface of the wheel arch. Well, now for news of a young man who's reached the pinnacle of success for an apprentice technician. Edward Kershaw, who works in the Accident Repair Department of Harpwell's Oxford, recently received the Turner Award as Young Craftsman of the Year. 
The presentation was made early last month by Douglas Hurd, Secretary of State for the Home Office, amidst tight security in Hartwell showroom at Kidlington in Oxford. The Road Transport Industry Training Board awards the trophy annually to the candidate who achieves the highest standards in a comprehensive examination. Well, Enwood of Begbroke, Oxfordshire, passed with distinction to gain this year's award. Congratulations, Edward. Reports have been coming in of damage to manual sunroof handles on the Rover 800 series due to incorrect use. To facilitate the opening and closing of manual sunroofs, instructions, as set out in the vehicle handbook, must be strictly followed. First, press the hatched end of the handle to release it from the stowed position. Then, pull the handle back and push up to engage the lock. This is important as the sunroof could only be operated with the handle lock engaged. To stow the handle after either opening or closing the sunroof, you must first press the lock release before attempting to fold the handle. Then rotate it until aligned with the recess and stow as normal. Now if you don't press the lock release trigger and exert undue pressure on the handle, you may well damage the whole mechanism. It's imperative that you advise your customers of the correct way to operate the sunroof, perhaps at the after-sales service, or even sooner if possible. And of course, PDI is the ideal opportunity to ensure you're familiar with the procedure yourself. Well now to news of a course to be held at Product Training College in addition to those already published. Five one-day courses have been organized to cover Rover 800 air conditioning commencing on Monday, September the 8th. Candidates should already have a knowledge of the refrigerant side of air conditioning systems since the course covers only the controls and unique elements applicable to the Rover 800 range. Diagnosis using fast check will also be included. A training bulletin will be issued explaining the content of the course in more detail and application forms should be sent to course administration as quickly as possible. Now, a bit of action to round the program off. The SOMG Metro Challenge. Drivers Peter Baldwin and Dave Carvel dominate the leaderboard in both the UK and international series. Dave and Peter are just two of the drivers in the challenge sponsored by Austin Rover dealers. Apple Yards of Harrogate are giving their support to Dave and Marshalls of Cambridge, where Peter works, are making sure their name is being seen. Other dealers involved in supporting the Metro Challenge are Chelsmore Garage in Birmingham, Apple Yards of Bradford and Francis Marshall of Oundle. If you'd like to see the remaining UK races of the 1986 season, the dates are August 25th and October 4th and 5th, both taking place at Silverstone. And if you're feeling really flush, there are also six international races between the end of August and the beginning of October. Full details of these can be obtained from Malcolm Swetnam of Austin Rover Motorsport at Cowley, Oxford. But don't just leave it there. If you actually want to participate in the MG Metro Challenge, it's open to anyone. So if there are any budding Nigel Mansells out there, get in touch with Motorsport, who will be only too pleased to give you all the details. The MG Metro Challenge is also a great way for Austin Rover dealers to gain publicity through sponsorship. There are plenty of opportunities to get involved and the possibility of winning a special dealer trophy at the end of each season. Motorsport can always put dealers in touch with drivers looking for support or maybe you and your dealership can form a winning combination to match Peter Baldwin and Marshalls of Cambridge. So that's all for this time. Don't forget, if there's anything you'd like to see in future programmes, here's our address. Service News... P.O. Box 29, Cowley, Oxford, OX4, 2XB. I'm Brian Conway, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next edition of Service News.